Good morning, everyone. On the behalf of Team Dente Channel Online, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. I am Dr. Aditi Mishra, and I'll be the host for today's session on the topic Maxillary Sinus Lift Procedures An Overview of Current Techniques by Dr. Ishwarya. So, before starting with the session, I have a few housekeeping notes to make. If you have any doubts during the session, you can put your questions in the question and answer box, and we'll be taking up questions at the end of the session. If you have joined us from Facebook and YouTube Live, you can ask us questions by commenting and each and every question will be answered at the end of the session. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our today's speaker to everyone. Dr. Eshwarya has completed her BDS from VYWS Dental College and Hospital, Amravati, Maharashtra. She has completed her MDS in Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery from SDKS Dental College and Hospital, Nagpur, Maharashtra. She has a special interest in oral implantology, hard and soft tissue augmentation, extraction socket preservation. She is the course director and founder of Clinical Implant Excellence Academy India. She recently won an award as Young Implantologist of the Year 2020, conferred by Global Outreach Healthcare Award 2020. Her academy has also won an Award New Practice of the Year 2020 by Indian Professional Awards 2020. Her academy has also won an award Best Startup Dentistry by International Award of Excellence and Dent Asia Dental Award 2020 London. She has been recently nominated in Global Outreach Healthcare and Medical Association, India's Top 100 Doctors in Dentistry for Year 2020. She has been nominated and elected in class of 2022 interdisciplinary cohort World Top 100 Doctors by Global Summit. She has been the guest speaker at World First Virtual Dental Implant Expo 2020, guest speaker at Chesa Dent Academy New Delhi, guest speaker at Dentoscope Academy New Mumbai, guest speaker at webinar on oral health and dental care conference Dubai UAE, guest speaker at World Second World Implant Expo 2020-2021. Her academy has conducted many virtual webinars on various aspects of implantology with national and international speakers around the world. She has been the speaker with International Global Summit and with Dr. Ruth Daly Carpini from Italy, where she discussed on importance of extraction socket preservation in implant therapy. Welcome, Dr. Eshwarya. Thank you so much for such a nice introduction. So uh, we will start our session. So welcome everyone of you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Ashwara Kadu and I'm the Associate Professor in SDK Dental College and Hospital Nagpur. And I'm also the course director and the founder of Clinical Implant Excellence Academy. So we will be discussing about the maxillary sinuses procedure, a recent overview on the current techniques. So we will first come to the anatomy of maxillary sinus. So we all know that maxillary sinus is a pyramidal shape and is the largest of paranasal sinuses. So it has an anterior wall, posterior wall, medial wall, lateral wall, as well as superior and inferior. So we are going to discuss about the each walls in a very uh, elevated way. So the anterior wall is formed by the fascial surface of maxilla and is internally grew by the canalus sinuses, that is called as the canine posa, which has the anterior, superior, alveolar nerves and the vessels. The landmark for the anterior wall of maxillary sinus is the thin canine fossa, infraorbital foramen located in the mid superior region and the infraorbital groove. Then, coming to the posterior wall, it is formed by the infratemporal surface of maxilla and it forms the anterior border of the pterygopalatine fossa. So now coming to superior wall of maxillary sinus, you can see this. This is your superior wall of maxillary sinus. And it is actually uh, formed by the triangular orbital floor. So this is your orbital floor. 
this is the orbital this is your infraorbital groove and this is intermaxillary artery so this is the lateral wall of maxillary sinus so now coming to the medial wall of maxillary sinus it separates the sinus from the nasal cavity it is very smooth on the sinus side and carries the inferior nasal conchi on the nasal side the medial wall is rectangular in shape and is slightly deficit at its opening which is called as the maxillary hiatus or hiatus seminara the opening is partially closed in the articulated skull by the section of inferior turbinate unicinate process perpendicular plate of palatine bone lacrimal bone and overlying mucosa that forms the ostium so here we will see about this is the inferior nasal concha okay this is the opening of maxillary si sinus this below the concha is called as a inferior nasal mucus and then this side is called as the hiatus seminaris and this bulging is called as the ethmoidal bulla so this one is also the opening of the spinoidal sinus so the ostium opens into the inferior part of ethmoidal infundibulum and passes through the seminal hiatus and then finally into middle lateral nasal meatus so this is the middle lateral concha middle nasal concha and this is middle nasal Meters. Okay, so the ostium is an elliptical shape throughout the prenatal development and is located in the anterior third of its model in front of you. In adults, however, the ostium is located between the middle and the posterior third of its model in front of you and tend to position closer to the roof of the sinus than the floor. So now, <clears throat> the lateral apex of the maxillary sinus. And extend towards the zygomatic process. So, if you see, this is the zygomatic arch and it's extending downward. So, this much is the zygomatic process of maxillary sinus. So, when you see in the CBCT, you will get this type of extension, and this is the zygomatic process of maxilla. So now the floor of the sinus is formed by the alveolar and a palatine process of the maxilla and it lies below the nasal cavity, which is usually located from the mesial part of the first prevolo to the distal part of the third volo with the lowest at the first and the second prevolo. So you can see here a passage of the root. So now the particular peculiarities in the sinus is there is a presence of septum. So there is a conical elevation which is projected into the cavity and reflecting the roof of the maxillary sinus frequently it is observed in general premolars and this bony wall and the septa that project inside the cavity uh, from the floor of the uh, floor and the lateral wall also so in fact the septa may divide the entire sinus into two or more completely separate and this incidence varies from the 18 to 58 percent septa are classified as the primary or the secondary the former being developed developed in nature while the latter is caused by irregular primatization followed by loss of posterity New, numerous variation of maxillary sinus septae are described in the literature and as the partial perpendicular septa or the partial horizontal septa or the complete septation of maxillary sinus by complete vertical septa so you can see here this is your lateral wall and this is the floor of the maxillary sinus. So you can get the septa in the lateral wall also or you can get the septa which you completely divide your maxillary sinus into two. So now this is a certain uh, variation uh, proposed. So the first one is called the multiple septa. Second is the single septa. That is two basal septa, third one. And the fourth one is the complete septa, which divided. And the fifth one is the partial horizontal septa, which you mostly get from the 
lateral wall of uh, sinus. So now coming to the sinusoidal membrane, what do you understand by sinusoidal membrane? It is the sinus membrane and it is the thin bilaminal mucoperistyl membrane that lines the maxillary sinus. It is a thin layer of pseudo stratified columnar epithelium and is the most important barrier for protection and the defense of the sinus cavity. The physiologic importance of this membrane is its cilia, which guides you for the mucus uh, discharge and the debris through the ostium, and it helps for the normal functioning and is properly making the sinus drainage. So here, yeah, this is the pseudo-columnar epithelium. This is the basement membrane. And this is mucous gland inside. This is actually the lamina propria. So the membrane can be 0.8 mm thin, and the sinus mucosa is actually very less vascular and thinner than even the nasal mucosa. The elevation of the membrane is very delicate procedure, so its maintenance of its integrity is very much important. So now coming to the vascular supply of maxillary sinus, it is primarily its vascular supply is derived from the branches of the maxillary artery, basically the posterior superior alveolar artery, infraorbital artery, and posterior lateral nasal artery. The posterior superior alveolar artery can course along the medium wall of the sinus. Now the posterior superior alveolar artery and the infraorbital artery are asked to move with each other at the anterior lateral wall of the sinus supplying mucous membrane of the nasal chamber. So the posterior lateral nasal artery branches from the phenopalatine artery, this is also another artery which supplies the maxillary sinus, which is branch of phenopalatine artery and passes through the phenopalatine foramen to enter the nasal cavity, which I shown you in my last time that is the nerve which passes through the foramen. So along with that is part the posterior nasal lateral nasal artery. So now uh, I said we got the posterior superior artery and the infraorbital artery anastomosis at the anterolateral wall of the sinus. So that anastomosis is called as alveolar anterior artery, triple A, which is alveolar anterior artery and is the anastomosis of posterior superior alveolar artery and the infraorbital artery. It has a curvilinear pattern and roughly paralleling the sinus flow with the lowest position at the secondary molar and the first molar area, which are the most common side, which is needing for augmentation. <clears throat> so you see this anastomosis. This is the posterior superior artery and this is the maxillary artery and this is the infraorbital uh, um, artery. So the anastomosis is called as the alveolar Antral artery. So now this is very important artery, and the distance of alveolar antral artery from the alveolar ridge varies greatly and may depend whether on the edentomous patient uh, from age and gender. There is a lot of variation. So the shortest distance from the alveolar crest and the um, alveolar antral artery occurs at the first and the second premolar, which range around. Uh, 15 to 25 mm of alveolar bone height in the dentate region. So it is recommended that to preserve this alveolar anterior artery, the minimum 8 mm of bone, you should create your bony window below 8 mm from this artery to preserve this vessel. So you can see this in the radiograph. See this? This is the alveolar anterior artery. So now again, there is a very uh, difficult to detect in the CBCT, which is called as a cone bank computer topography. So there are uh, three types of uh, artery which you can find it. Either you can find it intra, which is called as intra bony, or you can find it intraosseous, or you can go or you can find it in the exosseous region. So you have to be very peculiar when you uh, study your CBCT and you have to check where you can find your alveolar antelatory. So now uh, we will also discuss about the contour of your flow of your maxillary sinus. 
So there is a certain classification of maxillary sinus contour, and it is very important in terms of sinus flow elevation surgery. So you can see this the various types of contour. So A is a narrow tapered, this B is the tapered, C is the totally ovoid, and D is the square. So again, E is the irregular one. So in the irregular one, you can also have the subtypes, which is E1, where the tooth root protrude into the sinus floor. There is irregular sinus floor, and E3 is there is the presence of subtype. So now, what can be the indication and the contraindication for maxillary sinus flow? For that, to proceed ahead. You have to do the very careful and appropriate selection of the patient should be based on the well-defined clinical indication and is critical for the long-term success of sinus flow elevation. There should be proper case selection and re that require the proper clinical and the radiographic examination and careful treatment planning. The primary indication for sinus grafting surgery is to plan implant in the edentulous patient where the inter arch distance is less. So now what can be the risk factor which is associated with maxillary sinus lifting procedure? There are two risk factors can be high or the moderate. The high risk factor is the chronic periodontitis and acute sinusitis is a high risk factor and there are chances to have the failure if there is a presence of infection like in the acute sinusitis. And the moderate risk is smokers. Actually, why it's so important? Because the smokers doesn't fail your graft. You have to place your graft inside the maxillary sinus. So if the patient is a truly smoker, it delay its healing. So if the patient is a truly smoker, you have to tell your patient to avoid smoking for at least 15 to 20 days post your surgery. If there is any abnormality in the sinus membrane, for in case hypertrophy, for in case um, uh, presence of polyp inside the sinus. So the absolute contraindication is eradicated patients or the patients who is taking the back of units. So now we will discuss about the various radiographic imaging techniques which we can study the maxillary sinus. The first is your IOP, which is called the intraoral uh, radiograph, where you can see this is the um, floor of your maxillary sinus. Then you can take the panoramic radiography like OPG, so you can here also see it. Okay, you can also take the CBCT to study your maxillary sinus. So these are the various slices, and you can study it properly, or you can also take the CT scan where you, this is your maxillary sinus and you can check the patency of your ostium. Why it's so important to check the patency of your ostium is because if a uh, neighboring get perforated, sometimes the graft which you please can get inside. So the patient may have the complication of rhinitis and all other things. So if the ostium is patent, so it will help you to uh, undertake uh, so it's very important to have the patency of your ostium. So you have to check it using the CT scan. Now comes to posterior atrophic maxima. So this is most common situations you see in the edentulous patients. So these are certain classification and the clinical characteristic. And based on that, you can go ahead with the surgical approaches. So in the class, uh, in the group one, there is an insufficient subantral bone height where there is an adequate width in the alveolar ridge and it is acceptable in both vertical and the horizontal height. And it gives a better interact relation. So in this case, you can proceed with sinus work, proceed with the bone substitute from our or you can go with the alveolar uh, bone grafting with any internal donor sites. Then the group two, there is insufficient sub bone height. There is inadequate width of the alveolar ridge, but there is an acceptable vertical interage relationship. So in this case, you have to go with the horizontal ridge augmentation using autogenous 
block graft may be combined with the bone substitute or a barrel membrane. Intraoral or extraoral donor site depend on your extent of your atrophy. So the group three, again, there is insufficient subantral bone height. There is adequate width of the alveolar ridge, but there is acceptable horizontal interactive relation, but there is unfavorable vertical interactive relation due to advanced crustal resorption. So what you do in this case is you will need the sinus flow elevation procedure as well as the vertical ridge augmentation using autogenous block graft. You may combine it with the bone substitute again and the barrier membrane and your site between each other or the distant donor site. So in the um, group four, again, there is insufficient subantral bone height. There is unfavorable inter relation due to advanced horizontal and the vertical pressure resorption. So here you will require sinus fluor elevation along with the horizontal and the vertical augmentation. So you can do that using um, autogenous block graft and using the bone substitute and the barrier membrane. So now what are the various types of maxillary sinus lift procedure? So it is divided into two types, the direct sinus lift procedure and the indirect one. So direct sinus lift procedure is also called as the lateral window technique. And indirect sinus surgery is also subdivided into various techniques. So the first is inflatable catheter technique or other name for the inflatable catheter technique is the balloon technique. Other is the summer osteotome technique, intralift techniques, and the hydraulic technique. So we are going to discuss in short the indirect sinus lift procedure first. Before that, we will discuss the guidelines for selecting the transcrestal, transcrestal means indirect. So transcrestal versus the lateral window technique. So it's based on your subantral bone height. So as per international team of uh, implantology, it says that if the sinus floor anatomy is there as a horizontal augmentation is required and the subantral bone height is greater than 6 mm, so you can go with the transverse and miss entire process. But if it's less than 6 mm, then you can go with the lateral window. Then in the sinus floor ability is oblique or the vertical, there is a deficiency, then you can go both with the in both the cases, you have to go with the lateral window technique. So now the guidelines for selecting the stage approach versus the simultaneous approach for the lateral window pain. What do you understand by the stage approach and the simultaneous approach? Stage approach means, as you know, that we are going forward with the sinus elevation procedure for placing an implant where there is very less residual bone height. So the stage approach means I'm going, doing it in the two stage surgery. My first surgery will be the sinus floor elevation and my second surgery, I will do it after six months because the bone is properly firm and then place my implant. Simultaneous approach means I am doing the sinus floor elevation. Simultaneously, I'm placing an implant. So this is the two approaches and you have to properly plan whether I have to go with the stage approach or I have to go with the simultaneous approach. So the lateral window technique for the stage approach, you should decide if the subantral bone height is less than 5 mm. So here you require the maximum uh, elevation as well as maximum bone height. So in this case, without racing, you can go with the stage approach. And if it is greater than 5 mm, then you can decide to do the simultaneous approach. So now what are the various instrumentation of the maxillary uh, sinus procedure? So for the instrumentation of lateral window technique, you require the round carbide bow, the direct sinus lift instruments to elevate the membrane. You get it such as get the red instrument, it is readily available for the direct sinus lift and it is used to elevate your membrane. And then the surgical instrument to compress your grafting material. So you need the uh, bone grafting kits to, it also has in that kit, it has a, a bone carrier, it has a bone injector, it has a bone condenser. Condenser or it's called as a compactor, which compacts your graft properly. 
and you might also require the bootstrapping. Sometimes your uh, sometimes when you create a window, you sometimes have to create the window a uh, one to two mm above the uh, floor of the science. Sometimes you can undergo the scraping of your floor of the sand to smoothen it. So this you can add as autogenous craft. So that is the board scrapper. So here you'll see this is a sinus, uh, direct sinus with instrument. And uh, this is also called as the grafting material compressor. So you compress it, your graft material. Then the instrument for the indirect sinus lift technique is the indirect sinus lift osteotomes. So these are the osteotomes. So that the two surfaces of osteotome. You can get it as a convex or the concave. Surgical instrument to compress again the graft material, bone scraper, or you can also take the use of bone mass. This is bone mass, you have to crush it. You can take one autogenous graft from there if you're getting one block. You know, you repair the window and you remove that window. So you can use that window as an autogenous graft. Use your bone mile, crush it, and use it as an autogenous graft in combination with your bone substitutes. So now we are going to discuss about the indirect sinusoidal procedure. So the first is the inflatable catheter technique. It was first given by the Oscar Health Tantrum in 1974. And what he proposed is he says that there should be the transcrest sinus lift using the balloon catheter. So here you can see it. He underwent the osteotomy, did it. And uh, here he... So here he uh, do the osteotomy, place the catheter inside and then Then place, I place inside the catheter and then deflate my balloon and this will help to elevate my sinus floor without any tear. And once it is uh, elevated, my sinus floor is elevated, I put the bone substitute inside and close it. Okay. Again here, I can uh, go with the simultaneous or the straight approach. Now the summer osteotome technique, so you get certain amount in this. It is like osteotome technique and you get certain osteotomes which we i have shown you in the last pic and it was first given by the summer in 1994 and he proposed to use the osteotome break your window a uh, great window break fracture your sinus floor and then place an implant and place the graft inside and then place your implant so this introduced the sinus lift technique with the use of osteotome to elevate the membrane and it was eliminated the hammering and make the technique more comfortable for the patient which can be combined with the graft material along with the implant and a less traumatic one. But still sometimes you have to use the hammer in case. So it is still the technique sensitive. Now the next is the hydraulic sinus lift technique. So hydraulic means you're using some liquid to create the hydraulic pressure inside. So here in this method, the sinus membrane is lifting through the crystal approach and it's characterized by the hydraulic detachment of the mucosa through injection of liquid by spontaneous expulsion and aspiration. And in the same time, simultaneously feeling the substance in space with the solid or the semi-solid grafting material. So here, after creating an astronomy, I am going to put inside uh, my catheter. Um, place any liquid forcefully and expel it inside. So this you can use it normal saline or anything that which can increase the uh, sinus flow membrane. So now the next is the sinulus system. So you ready? This is the disposable system. So you can readily get available. And it is a minimally invasive two stage indirect sinusoidal procedure, which is called the sinusoidal system. And it is utilizing beta tricalcium phosphate in conjunction with the platelet rich plasma. So you get the disposable, that is where there is the curates, you can do, get osteotomes and all other things to do the sinus lifting technique. So now coming to the direct 
sinus left or the lateral window tetanus and how we should do step-by-step -step procedure for it. The first which you have to discuss is about the anesthesia. You have to do infrabital, posterior, superabular, greater palatal nerve block, subperistal anesthesia through the slow infiltration. After giving an anesthesia, you should go proceed with incision. So here you have to give the mid crested incision followed by the vertical releasing incision for adequate room for creation of the lateral window. After your lateral window is created, you have to first mark with the sterile pencil, which is autoclavable. And <coughs> you can see here, this is how I have marked it. After the marking, I will create my window using the round pearl. And after that, I will start elevating the membrane using the sinus lift elevation instruments, which are blunt instruments, and this will elevate carefully started from the sinus flow and then extend to the anterior and the posterior walls with the help of the sinus cubits. After that, if you are going with the simultaneous approach, you can go ahead with the preparation of implant site. So for that, you have to, there should be the minimum of three to four mm of residual crystal bone of good quality. And it is possible to place implant simultaneously or place implant after four to six months. After elevating, grafting it inside the graft material, you have to place your graft. And the sinus membrane should be protected with the collagen membrane. It is more important. But it should be protected because due to pressure, there are chances that there can have the sinus perforation. So you have to place, before placing a graft, you should place your collagen membrane first and then below you place your graft. So the implant are placed in the prepared side, bone graft are placed in the less accessible area and the posterior disease are filled first, followed by the area along with the medial sinus wall. And the most important thing is don't compact much of your graft. So this will prevent your vascularization within the graft. As you know, the sinus membrane is less vascular. Then you will, if required, you can place the membrane, the suburban membrane over the window to secure your graft and then close your soft tissue using non-resolvable, non-monofilament sutures and horizontal matrix sutures are used to secure your flap. So this is horizontal matrix suture. So now I will discuss one case which I have done. So this is a case of mattress sinus augmentation using the lateral window approach. So the case reported to me with the sinus pigmentization with only 3.5 to 4.5 bone residual bone height available. So this is my pre-op photographs. I underwent the marking of my incision. I have given this mid crest incision and this is my vertical releasing incision. Then elevation of my mucoperistal flap and I have elevated in such a way that I get assessed properly for to create the lateral window. Then marking of the window lateral approach where I have marked it. Okay. After marking, I created the window and start elevating my membrane. So my membrane is intact post the sinus floor elevation. So here I will show you one minute. So wait a minute. You can see this. You can see here my membrane is 
in order to see whether your membrane is intact. For that, you have to ask your patient to breathe. If your membrane is moving rhythmatically, that shows your membrane elevation is proper and there is no perfusion. If the rhythm of your sinus membrane uh, rhythm is irregular, then there are chances that there might be the sinus elevation. So then I sutured it. So this is my pre-op and this is my poster. So you can see here, I have elevated it to compare it with the normal. This is where my sinus floor has been elevated. So the complications and it management. So there are sinus perforation. The first and most foremost complication is your sinus perforation. And the most common injured operative complication which usually occur in very 7% or 35% of sinus augmentation procedures. And if a membrane is perforated, when curating the lateral window outline, osteotomy is extended to the seven, several millimeters beyond the original window to establish contact with your remaining intact membrane, elevate it. And if the membrane perforation occur during lifting your sinus membrane, and this, there is a very small defect, less than 2 mm, then it can be left itself to here. But if your perforation is more than 2 mm, then the opening should be patched with a piece of hydrated resorbable collagen barrier that is large enough to cover your tear for the several millimeters. Then the next is your plating. See, I told you if you tear your anterior artery, so bleeding is most a process during your anterior artery. So you have to check periodically and then plan your case. So if there is a bleeding during performing the osteotomy, you can control it by placing the gauze soap with the anesthetic solution that contains epinephrine directly into the membrane. Or you can also take with the direct pressure of artery forceps using an artery force. So you can see here, this is an artery, so you can uh, clamp it using the uh, artery forceps. And it can be managed using the cautery unit also. Another method of causing intraosinous arterial bleeder is to displace the membrane and compress using mosquito homostat, and thereby crushing the bone and obstructing the bleeding blood vessels. But it is again very risky. So you have to check from where your bleeding is coming from and act accordingly. Then again, when if you're going with the simultaneous approaches, the most common complication is dislocement of your implant in the sinus. And this basically happens, occurs several days post-implantation or at the abutment connection uh, surgery or a year later. So this usually happens if your bone quality is not proper, whether the bone has not underwent an ocean integration or this may be due to positioning your implant very opacally. This leads to dislocement of your implant in such sense. So in such a case, you have to remove your implant again within the lateral window approach or whichever approach is possible for you. Remove your implant and uh, give them the patterns. So the take home message is, climatization of maxillary sinus is literally secondary to your maxillary tooth loss and this prevent placing an implant in early stage. So maxillary sinus elevation and augmentation provide the predictable outcome of regenerating the lost osseous structure in the posterior maxilla. And this offers the patient may take advantage of long-term success. So you must try indirect or the direct maxillary sinus procedure if your subantral bone height is less than 5 mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor, for this amazing presentation. So I request uh, participants, if you have any doubts, you can put your questions in the question and answer box so that uh, we can proceed with the question and answer session. And uh, meanwhile, I'll just uh, introduce our uh, participants to our organization.
so we are dental channel online with the motto healthy smiles that leads to healthy lives uh, our website is www.dentalchannel.online you can find us on all the social media platforms facebook instagram twitter linkedin youtube whatsapp and telegram we are the first uh, digital dental media marketing company which is catering to academic professional and commercial needs of dental students practitioners organizations businesses and dental industry leaders and bring, being a prime member you can avail a lot of benefits one of which uh, is uh, you can you will be receiving e certificate which will be containing one fda germany ce point which is exclusively for the prime member the annual prime membership will cost you just 799 rupees and if you are uh, subscribing to a prime membership uh, using my code which is adt100 you will be availing one uh, good discount on the annual membership uh, price for all the latest updates kindly save this number and uh, send your uh, name as a text message on this number so that you are added to our uh, broadcast list and uh, you will be updated regarding each and every upcoming event that we have our sponsors uh, nova mind gmbh they have the innovative dental and healthcare solutions to ensure your success they have the generic implants and prosthetic solutions if you have missed out our live session you can go back to facebook and youtube uh, and check our recorded session there uh, with the handle dentist channel online let's quickly move to the question and answer session okay so uh, dr first question is from dr priyanka she is asking uh, nowadays intra intra sinus implant placement also doing with rough surface like bioline implants is this effect on sinus in long term Very good question. See, uh, the surface treatment of your implant system ideally matters a lot. There are two type of surface treatments which are done in the implant. That is the adaptive one and the subjective. What do you understand by adaptive one? Means the one which we are adding on the implant surface, and the subjective one is we are subtracting from the implant surface. So the surface treatment, if in the bilateral implant, it has the adaptive surface treatment. so it has a um, addition of hydroxyapatite coating so it is actually good one your adaptive surface treatment should be in such a way that it bring about the affinity of the bone towards your implant surface so actually uh, when you decide which system to be used in this such cases that i think you go with the subjective one because this will increase your surface area and it will give you the maximum osteo integration in a lesser period and you can be safer to place it so for me i think even with the bioline which you have which is it is successful but for that you have to also think which how much amount of my subantral bone height is there based on that i will think if your subantral bone height is less than 5 mm then even if you prepare an osteotomy and if the bone quality is not good there are chances for failure of osteo integration so each and every implant system give gives you the success to the maxillary sinusic procedure but for that you have to properly plan your case and then go ahead with the system your simultaneous approach or your stage approach actually most of them prefer the stage approach because it is very safer one but i would suggest don't go with the stage approach all the time because the stage approach where you place your graft and after 6 months you call your patient back and then try to place an implant sometimes what happens your whichever you are placing the graft material that also depends it's not necessary which type of graft material you are placing autogenous or allograft or combination of allograft or xenograft so based on that sometime when you uh, compact your graft very condensingly so it decreases your vascularization also so this will leads to less o formation there and there are chances to be get the failure so for the osseo integration also you need the vascularization that is more important so uh, as per your question i think there is not much uh, difference of any system so moving on to the next question uh, it is from dr iftikhar he is asking uh, is this procedure advised in patients with chronic sinusitis no 
in the chronic sinusitis, there are the patient has the major chances of uh, infection within the sinus membrane. So for that, first you have to treat your child with sinusitis first. Um, take the help of ENT, reduce the chronic sinusitis, and then place your ENT. Because if you place in a patient with chronic sinusitis, there are chances that there will be infection within the sinus membrane and there will be the uh, infection within placing the implant also. So I would suggest don't go in the patient having the chronic sinusitis. The question we have from Dr. Lakshmi, she is asking, do you place implant immediately with sinus augmentation or wait and reapproach after a few months? And if so, how long do you wait? Ideally, it depends on the cases and depends on the patient preference also. Because most of the patients are very insecure of doing this procedure. So we have to tell the uh, patient all the procedure. So patient mostly prefer for the uh, stage process. But for me, I will prefer the simultaneous approach because what is there is I'm placing the graft. I can be short shot using my graft material. So I will suggest to go with the simultaneous approach because this will reduce the time of the surgery. No one will going to like you to have the two surgeries in between the period of uh, four to six months. And then the question that she has is how long do you want to wait? So I would suggest you to wait, depend on your graft material. Likewise, I show in the case, I use the allograft combined with the xenograft. So xenograft mm -hmm. has a maximum resorption rate. So I will prefer to wait six to six months. But if I preferably wait with the alloplastic material along with the autogenous, so base I can wait for the four to five months, basically. Fair enough. So uh, with this note, uh, I guess uh, we should wind up today's session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor, for being with us and uh, looking forward for uh, more events with you in future. Uh, thank you to all the participants for being with us. So with this, we are ending the session. Thank you and have a great day. Right?